Welcome to the Sunday evening services of First Baptist Church, Gordonsville, Tennessee. We are so excited that you joined us tonight to share the Word of God and study how He wants us to live as His church during these days. I would be remiss if I didn't make comment about the beautiful day we've had. What a pleasant day to have. Uh, the breeze, the cool temperature, the pretty sunshine, and they say heaven's going to be better than this. It's going to be a wonderful thing to go to heaven and see a better place than where, what we have enjoyed in the last couple of days. Well, we're sharing in our Sunday night services uh, a small series entitled The Basic Functions of the Church. In the midst of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, stay-at-home situation, many folks are deciding, well, maybe we can just continue to stay at home. We don't need to go to church. We can go here to the house, turn on our computer, our TV, and we can just watch the services. But there are some things we've been assigned to do as a church that can't be done in isolation in our own living rooms or away from the church facility. We come together for a purpose and I've been sharing the purposes of the church, the functions we are to perform, and uh, we've already looked at the fact that uh, we're called together to worship the Lord, we're called to fellowship together as His church, we're called to uh, teach and make disciples, and we're called together to pray as a body and seek the face of God. Uh, tonight I want to share three other of the functions, and we'll close out this series and I hope that when we finish, you will say, yes, uh, we need to come together. The church needs to function as a body. And so I hope that will motivate you to get back in church just as soon as possible. The basic text we've been examining during this series is found in the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41 and reading down through verse 47. Uh, you remember that Acts chapter 2 is when Peter preached that powerful message on Pentecost, and it has had a tremendous impact on the people that were there. So many people were saved, and the church was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And uh, as we look at it, you'll see that the church began to function as a body. So let's read and look at how the early church began to function. Verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So, let me ask you a question. What would the world be like without the church? What if the church was not here? What if the church was gone? What would the world be like? You know, some have even said, who needs the church? Well, what we believe the Lord's going to call his church home soon to meet him in the air. And then the world's going to realize how important the church was to society. There's a scripture that we want to examine as we begin looking at this concept. It's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter number uh, 2 and verses 7 and 8. Listen as I read. Chapter 2, 7, and 8. But the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth 
and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, according to this text, something is restraining the activity of the wicked one, the influence of Satan and his emissaries on this earth. And I believe that restrainer is the church of the Lord Jesus that's been empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And he's going to be restrained, he's going to be hindered until we're taken out of the way. And then the world will find out how important we were to society. Not only does the church restrain, but the church also is the source of truth about how to go to heaven. And we are also, as the church, a source of much generosity and kindness. So the church is not to hide its influence behind t fear and timidity. We are to stand out and be known as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, tonight I want to finish this series on the functions of the church. And we're going to begin by looking at the function of being evangelistic and doing mission work, evangelism and missions. And when you look at evangelism and missions, evangelism is sharing the gospel with someone that you meet or someone you're in their presence, but then missions is going somewhere else and doing evangelism, going somewhere else and sharing the good news. In our text, Peter preached the gospel that day, and 3,000 souls were saved. That's evangelism. He told them about Christ and what he came to do, and they received Christ as Savior and were born again. 3,000 souls on that one day. And then it tells us in verse 47 that people began to be saved every day and were added to the church. So without a doubt, there is a very important function the church is to perform, and that's to evangelize and share the gospel with every creature. You remember before our Lord ascended back to heaven, he gave a specific assignment to his disciples who represented the church. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, we have what is known as the Great Commission. And this is what the Lord said we are to be doing. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That's our assignment, is to go preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Mark said when he explained this statement. In Mark chapter uh, 16, and it's verse number 15, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we have an assignment to share the gospel. Everybody needs to hear the gospel. We need to tell them of God's love, tell them that God is going to come and judge them, and they need to know that God made a provision for them to be forgiven through the blood of his Son, and through faith in Christ they can be forgiven and spend eternity in heaven. So there are three basic ways we can do our part in evangelizing and sharing the gospel with the world. One, it's very simple, what it said in Matthew 28, 19, go. And uh, God is still calling people to go share the gospel. You can do it as a lifetime missionary who surrenders to the will of God and says, God's called me to be a missionary. And in, in, in our church, we have a couple that's gone to Zimbabwe, uh, the Coal Tarp family. And they are there sharing the gospel, and we help send them out to do that exact thing, is to preach the gospel where we are not able to preach it. And so you can go. You can go as a full-time missionary. And I'm so glad God's still calling people to preach the gospel and to be missionaries and carry the gospel to other lands. And we're grateful that God gives them the desire and, and, and the commitment to make a sacrifice to leave family and home and comfort and go where they're called to share the gospel. And so you can go as a full-time missionary, but you can also go as a part-time missionary. We take mission trips. We send people to different places to share the gospel. And you may not be able to go as a full-time missionary, but you can take a week's vacation and go somewhere and share Jesus with another people, another 
country, another culture. And so we have the opportunity to go, and we ought to be willing to accept that challenge and be involved in the going. But then there's another way you can be, way you can be involved in uh, the mission and evangelism that Christ tells us to perform, and that, it, that is by praying. You see, the power of prayer should never be underestimated. And so we ought to pray for those that God sends out. Missionaries like the Cole Tarps have given us prayer cards. Why? We see their picture. When we see them, we think about what they're doing. We're prompted to pray. God bless them. Keep them safe. Make them effective. Lord, use them to bring many people to Jesus Christ. We ought to be praying for those who are going. And we also ought to be praying that the Spirit of God will be at work. I learned a long time ago as I tried to share the gospel with folks, God not only works on my heart to go share, but when I go share, I find out he's working on the heart of the person that I go see. And so we need to pray that the Spirit of God will con bring about the conditions that will make it right for people to receive Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you read Paul's writings in the epistles of the New Testament, you'll find many times he'd say, pray for me and pray for us that the gospel may have free uh, delivery as we share it to other people. And so we are either to go or maybe also pray, and then we can give. We are involved in supporting missions when we give our mission money. Uh, while we maybe aren't going and maybe haven't been called to go, we are part of the team that's carrying the gospel. And our job is to help pay the way for people to go and to share. And so that's why in the Southern Baptist Convention, we have the cooperative program and we give. And through that, we're supporting about 5,000 missionaries around the world and somewhere around 4,000 missionaries here in the United States. And so every time you give to your church, your church gives part of what comes into the cooperative program, and we put all that together, and millions of dollars are spent every year sharing the gospel with other people. And not only do we give to the cooperative program, but we take special offerings. At Christmas time, we take the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and that is used to specifically meet needs of the missionaries. They may need a vehicle. They may need some equipment. And so we give so that they might have the means in order to share the gospel effectively. And so the question I have for you tonight is, what part are you playing in making this happen? We are to be involved in sharing the gospel of Christ and carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the function of the church. And you go to Acts chapter 13, and it says that as they were praying, the Spirit of God said, separate Paul and Barnabas to go share the gospel where I've called them. And they laid their hands on them, prayed on them, sent them out, and they began their missionary journey and then came back later and reported what had happened and then they went off again and went again. They took at least three missionary journeys but they were based in the church and uh, at Antioch and they were prayed for and supported by the people. That's God's plan. That's part of the function of the church. And so we can never get away from our primary responsibility and that is to preach the gospel to every creature to the ends of the earth. I'm glad that I believe in sharing the gospel with other people. Here's a question I have for you. Why should anybody hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it once? You and I get to hear it, turn on the TV, turn on the radio. We hear gospel presentations. We can go to church several days during the week. But there are people in other parts of the country don't know that God loves them enough that he sent his son and that his son died to pay for their sins. They don't know. We who know so much ought to be willing to share. And so one of our basic functions is evangelism and missions. Another function of the church is ministry. If you look in verse 45 of our text, it says that the people sold some of their possessions and they put it together to meet the needs of people in the fellowship. So what they did was they got rid of some of their goods in order to meet the needs of other people. 
That's part of the basic ministry of the church is to share, to help meet needs of other people. Jesus made it very clear that he came to minister and also to teach us to minister. I want to read to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, and it's verse number 28. And I want you to notice what Jesus said clearly to his disciples about his coming. Chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ said, now, I didn't come to have people uh, do things for me. I didn't come to set up some type of special uh, kingdom that folks would bow before me here. His kingdom will come in the future. He came the first time to be the suffering Savior. He'll come the second time to be the reigning sovereign. And so he came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life for others. Then in John's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning in verse 13, he said, You call me Master and Lord? And you say, well, for I am. I am your master and our Lord. Now, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. You remember Jesus came into the upper room and they were uh, preparing for a, a fellowship meal over the Passover. And when Jesus got there, he took aside his garments wrapped himself in a towel and got a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples. You know, Peter said, Lord, you don't need to wash my feet. And he said, no, you don't understand. Uh, if you don't let me wash your feet, I, I can't have anything to do with you. He said, well, give me a bath. And, and the Lord said, you don't need a bath. You've already had your bath. You just need to wash your feet. And that means he was saved, but he needed to clean his feet where he contacted the world. And then when he got through, he said, you see what I've done? You call me Lord and Master, and that's right, I am your Lord and Master. And you notice I was not too good to get down and wash your feet. Now you do the same thing. You go out and wash the feet of others. He showed us how to minister. <clears throat> the church is at its best when it's trying to meet the needs of other people and ministering to those who need help. When... This lawyer came to the Lord one day. He said, Master, what are the two greatest commandments? Well, the number one commandment, Jesus said, is to lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, body, mind, and soul. Number two is love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to love your neighbor? How do you show love to your neighbor? Well, it's, it's one thing. You can express love and say, I love you, but it's even more important to show that I love you. In John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, notice what it says. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's goods and sees his brother have need, and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What's he saying? Put action to your words. If you tell somebody you love them, show it by meeting their needs. Here's the question that you're going to ask. Well, who's my neighbor? We, we want to know how far do I need to go? How, how much do I need to do this? And the, and the Lord uh, made it very clear. He, he, here's what he said. When he, when he gave us the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, your neighbor is anyone you meet that has a special need. I want to read to you the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a powerful story. It's found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses uh, 30 through 37. And Jesus taught a powerful example of ministry to his disciples. Chapter 10 of Luke, and it's verse number 30. And Jesus answering, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to the end and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host and said to him, Take care of him and whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. Which now of these three do you think was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. What did he use as illustrations of folks who might help you? He talked about the priest. He talked to Le about the Levite. Those were religious leaders in that day from the Jewish community. But when they saw the man, instead of helping him, they crossed the road and went past without doing anything for him. But then he said a certain Samaritan. Now remember, <clears throat> the Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. They were half-breeds, were looked down upon, didn't think they were very uh, worthy of attention. But this Samaritan came, he saw the man in need, and he stopped and helped him. He helped bind up his wounds, put him on his beast, carried him to the inn, said, take care of him, and I'll pay you whatever else I owe when I come back. That is a neighbor. And so, folks, let me tell you, we are called on to meet the needs of our neighbors. We are to minister in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our church has different items in our budget when folks give to the ministry of this church. We have a line item called benevolence. And we have several thousand dollars set aside for benevolent work in our community when there's needs. Instead of telling everybody about it, we just help try to meet that need as a church and we're grateful that we can. We also have another line item called church and community ministry. And these are things that we do in our community to share the love of Christ, to help others and meet needs. And that's just part of what we do. We also do backpack ministry to Appalachia where we uh, fill up those backpacks and with goodies and, and pencils and school supplies and toys and send them to Kids in Appalachia who are very needy, and uh, we have the privilege of sending a lot of backpacks every fall to those schools. And this is why we do White Christmas. You know, as part of White Christmas, we take our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, but then we ask you to come with gifts that have been wrapped in white paper, and we give those gifts to needy fo folks in the community, children who are underprivileged, maybe some folks in nursing homes, but that's why we do white Christmas. Then many times we'll do the Christmas shoe box as we uh, fill those shoe boxes up and Samaritan Purse shares those around the world. There are many other ways that we respond to the needs of hurting people. Why do we do that? That's what we're called to do. That's one of the basic functions of the church is to minister in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I do want to make an important point at this place of the message. Oftentimes, <clears throat> we have our pastor, our pastors, and we call them our ministers. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I want the church to understand something. The leaders of the church are not called by God to do the ministry in the community. God's called them to train and equip the members to do the ministry. And that's clearly defined for us in the book of Ephesians chapter number 4. And I want to read verses 11 and 12. Listen to what it says. And he gave some, gave to some churches, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers. So these are the leaders that he gave to the churches. Now why did he give them to the churches? For the perfecting of the saints. In other words, maturing the body of Christ, for the purpose of the work of ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. He said, we are to help perfect the church, mature the church, so that they can do the work of the ministry. And so our whole church should be involved in ministry in the community. We're living in a day where all kind of disasters are taking place around the world. Fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, any number of ways that people's lives have been disrupted, homes have been destroyed, and, and what do we have? We have relief workers come, and you'll see relief workers go around the world. One of the organizations that gets a lot of attention is the Red Cross. Does a good work. But can I let you in on a little secret? Most of the meals served by Red Cross in America when hurricanes come and floods, most of those meals, probably 90% of them, are prepared by Southern Baptist disaster relief units. They don't go with a fanfare of look who we are. They just go and start cooking food and providing meals. That's because we believe in doing ministry. And so it's one of the basic functions of the church is to minister to the people in need. So we have a church that's supposed to be sharing the gospel, carrying it at home and around the world, and we're to be ministering to meet the needs of those that we meet. There's one other function of the church I want to mention tonight. Maybe it's one you hadn't considered, but I believe it's an important function. We are called by our Lord to be salt and light to our world. In verse 47 of our text, it says that they had favor with all the people. That means they had an impact or an influence on the people, and the people responded favorably to what they were doing. I believe without, the doubt, without a doubt, the greatest influencer in the world is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount how this is to take place. And so I want to go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and look at verses 13 through 16 as he gives us this assignment, this function of being salt and light to our world. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven." Jesus said you've got two specific assignments in influencing your world. Number one, you are to be salt to the earth. That's a strange analogy. The, the church is to be salt. Well, let's think about the purposes of salt. Here's some things that we would do if we're salty Christians. We are, through our influence, should make society taste better. The Bible even says, who can eat the white of an egg without some salt? Uh, it's pretty bland, but the salt sure adds flavor to it. And think about our world. There's a lot of bitterness and hatred and malice. Even in the violence that's going on all over the country over the death of this poor man, Christians are to call for peace and justice and for doing the right thing. We are to make our society taste better. Then our influence should cause others to thirst for living water. It's all to make you thirsty. And it, it, if, if we're the Christian, we ought to be, people ought to look at our lives and say, man, I'd like to be like him. He has such joy. He has such peace. He just seems to have it together. And because of the life that we live, many people desire to come to know Christ. Our influence should help preserve the world from decaying. Years ago, before the invention of the refrigerator, uh, they packed meat and other perishables in salt to keep it from spoiling. 
It preserved the life. We as a church are keeping this world from rotting. Our influence for good and morality and righteousness is impacting the world. And you know what? Salt irritates an open wound. Our influence should be a source of irritation for those who practice evil. That's why the church is often hated because we stand against abortion. We stand against homosexuality and abuse of gender. We stand against the crimes against children and uh, uh, abuse of the moral values and marriage. And I could go on and on and on. And it makes people mad. Why don't the church shut up? We can't. We've been called to be salt to our earth. When we lose our saltiness, we no longer have an influence for good. Who wants to be called good for nothing? And that's exactly what the Lord said. If we're not salty Christians, we're good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. We have a responsibility to our community, our world, our society to be salt. Second, he said, we are to be light to the world. Well, what does light do? Light pushes back the darkness. Uh, you go out at night, you turn on the outside floodlight, and it pushes the darkness back so where you, you can see where you're going and you can see what's out there before you step outside. We are to show the true way by holding forth the light. I don't think I have to tell you that we're living in a wicked world that's full of evil. But God placed us here for a purpose, and that is to shine our light upon the situation. Listen as I read Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We're to be lights to our world in the midst of all the crooked, perverse things that are going on. We ought to be without rebuke. We are to expose the light to the evil around us. The church needs to be out front leading in these dark situations. We don't need to be hiding in the corner or in the closet. We need to come out and stand for what's right and to be known as people of peace and righteousness and justice. We're to provide answers to people who, who want to know how to live right. We ought to be sharing with them what God's Word says. Take the Ten Commandments. It's a good start on how to live right. So what happens when we are salt and light to our world? What happens? He said in verse 16 of our text, he said, he said this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Two things. Number one, when your light is shining and you're salty, they will see your good works. They will take note. That's the right way. That's the moral way. That's the good way. That's the godly way. And the second thing they'll do, they'll glorify our God in heaven because he allowed us to be an influence to those around us. There's an illustration I'd like to share, a couple of them really, from the book of Daniel about standing up and being light to your dark world. It's found in the book of Daniel. And the first one is chapter 2, and it's verse number 47. Listen as I read Daniel 2, 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing you could reveal this secret. When, when Daniel was able to take the king's dream and interpret it, and he saw it come to pass, he said, Your God is the real God. He's the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He can reveal secrets. And God was glorified through Daniel's influence as a man of God. And then you remember in chapter 3, the three Hebrew children who were thrown in the fire. 
Look at what happened when they came out, verses 28 and 29 of chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. That's a powerful testimony of the influence of three, three young Hebrew boys in the court of a heathen king. What a powerful statement he made about the God they serve. So they are to see our good works, glorify our Father which is in heaven. So as we have looked in the last three weeks, the church has some specific functions that we are to perform. And so here are the assignments we've been given. We're together together to worship and lift our voices to God in praise. We're together together to fellowship and encourage and exhort one another. We are together together to make disciples, help people follow Christ as their Lord and Master. We are together together to pray for His will to be done on this earth. We are together to preach the gospel to the lost. We are sent to minister to those in need, and we are to be salt and light to our world. So I, I want to ask you this. In the church that God's put you in, what are you doing to help the church be the church? This is what we're assigned to do, and we need to do it faithfully until he calls us home. May the Lord bless you. Have a good time this week being part of the family of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an assignment that we must perform while our Lord is waiting to return. Now, before I close, I want to share a word about plans for future services here at our church. We had thought that maybe next Sunday we would go back to full services of every activity, but after doing a survey of our workers and and teachers, we found that about 40% felt they weren't comfortable coming back at this time. And so here's what we've decided to do. We're going to continue our two services on Sunday morning with social distancing. And so we'll have a service at 9 o'clock and then another service at 1015. We're going to continue that through the months of June and July. On Sunday night, we're going to do what we are calling family fun nights. We're going into the gym. We're going to put down our tarps and set, set up our tables, and we'll be sitting together at tables as families, and we'll have a devotion, some music. You bring your own refreshments for your table. The church will provide the drinks, and then we'll be having activities that are family fun oriented, getting us back together as a church family in a safe environment. We'll be doing that for the next two months on Sunday night. Our Wednesday night service will continue to be streaming live, here from the church sanctuary. And Brother Wayne is continuing his study of the book of Malachi, and he has three more studies in that. Now, uh, Sunday school teachers will be asked for the leaders of children and youth at, uh, classes to be, develop an online training or some way to hand out materials to their classes so that they can continue to be studying even though they might not meet in the classroom. And then the adult classes, uh, if they want to have their own meeting through Zoom or maybe uh, go in the back and separate and have their classes while we're having a worship service out here, they may have Sunday school and then join us for the other service. Uh, we're pri trying to find a way to meet the needs of our church family and also be safe. And so I trust that you'll join us whenever possible. And may the Lord give you a great week. Let me pray for God's blessings on your life. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church that you have called out so that we might be the assembly uh, that does things that no other group can do to impact our world and to honor you. Help us this week to live for you. Help us to be faithful. Keep us safe. And Lord, may the Lord Jesus Christ be lifted up in our midst, for we pray in his name. 
Amen.